the gap between the mounting critical praise and his non-existent bank account balance took its toll on Tommy's dedication to non-commercial progressive music. In 1973, he accepted an offer to join the James Gang. When Joe Walsh called him and said, I've recommended you to replace me and the James Gang, that was a thrilling experience for him. And of course, we all said, you must do it. You must. You know, it's a great opportunity. And he realized that too. You know, he knew that we were floundering here and we weren't making the steps that we needed to make. We'd had this opportunity to get a recording contract. It hadn't happened. You know, we weren't really expanding our base of fans. and. Uh, and this was a godsend, really, you know, the James Gang opportunity, because it really forced us to write consistently together, and it gave him the opportunity to get out there and be challenged on a nightly basis in front of big crowds of people. And that was good. Well, that, that switch threw everyone for a loop. I mean, to go from the extreme of energy to the James Gang was just something no one expected. But um, he did it as a stepping stone. You know, it was exciting to play with experienced musicians who had made it on a grand scale. It was exciting for him to work with new people and uh, record with, you know, people like Tom Dowd and the opportunity to travel, you know, to start making money. I think it was just, a, a, you know, another new stepping stone to, be, to, to eventually go on to what he really wanted to do. You know, it wasn't the end. It wasn't, you know, his an eventual happiness it was just a you know progression and it was good for the time being it was very good I mean you know it was he was able to get music heard that he'd been writing and put on these albums that he couldn't have done with energy or with Zephyr and it was at this time that he'd collaborated with Jeff Cook and John Teaser and they were writing some beautiful stuff and it worked well with the with the James Gang albums Well, there really wasn't a style. We, there are some funny, I mean, a lot of the way that we wrote was I would write the lyrics and he'd write the music. You know, I'd hand him the lyrics and he'd go away. You know, I'd spend a lot of time sitting over a typewriter or pacing around a typewriter, knocking out a song, then I'd hand him the finished product and he'd go away and then next thing I'd know he'd come back with the song and we'd, we'd play it in the band. Or we'd, we'd start with lyrics and music together, we'd be talking together and we'd start making up different licks and whatever, you know, that would be, but I think it, toward the end it was, we'd be on the phone, he'd be in LA and I'd be in, in Denver and we'd just be on the phone at two o'clock in the morning knocking around ideas. You know, and he'd play a line, and, you know, musical line, and say, what do you think about that? And I'd say, well, you know, I've got these lyrics, and we'd just go back and forth. And I can remember being on the phone once, writing a song with him for two and a half, three hours that ended up being on a Purple record, Deep Purple record, you know. But it was like, <laughs> there were no really rules. We, we weren't formal about it, but it was a very easy process because he always had musical ideas. Constantly, he would do three or four versions variations on one song that I'd give him. You know, he might do a reggae version and, uh, you know, a soul version, a rock version, a jazz version, you know, those kind of influences. It would change. And then he'd do a major key or a minor key version, you know, which would change completely the complexion of the song. So he was always experimenting with it and changing it and, you know, trying to, to fine tune what he was working on. Tommy's stay in the James Gang ended in 1974. By then, he and Karen had pulled up their long-term roots in Boulder and moved to Los Angeles. It seemed his musical path was starting to pay dividends as he finally got the solo record deal he was denied in energy and, at David Coverdale's suggestion, was invited to join Deep Purple, the band who rivaled the Rolling Stones as the most popular band worldwide. 
Here's Tommy with Tim Weisberg and Barry Fay in a 1975 interview. Why you just did uh, Be that, quiet, man. I'm the host here. He's, 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 Barry, ask Tommy what he did. Tommy, what did you do? I mean, he, uh, uh, she was going on to the uh, What are we going to talk about? Are yes, doing he's the host, right? I guess that's what they say. I get paid more than you. And he answers for me. No, I did an album with Deep Purple. Mm hmm. Which took about a month. It'll be out in October. Really? October? October 25th. And I also did an, another one that was mine, which will be out. Ask the host. I mean. is, that a, is that before or after? October somewhere. Well, I think Purple is coming out November 8th, and yours is coming out October 25th. Let's see. That's why I come on uh, these shows. The host knows more than I do. Well, it's only when the host happens to be so closely tied to you. <laughs> uh, it is really fun being closely tied to Tommy Bowen because it, it's really not. Yeah. I'd like to hear about some of the material on your album. Thank on you. my album, I used... Well, can we um, take a vote on that? Would you like to hear about the material? <laughs> is he the, the host? Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's the host. Now I've become the host. No, I used on my album, I used like... Um, a lot of people you probably know I used... Uh, it's it's very varied from like... Uh, very varied, is that...? Sure. Quite varied. Quite, it's quite varied. Um, <laughs> from like very hard rock to some jazz type stuff that uh, I used, like, um, Lenny Weiss with Chick Corea and uh, Ayrto and Dave Sanborn mm -hmm. and Michael Brecker. Did you stretch out quite a bit, or is it? Yeah. It's no, far out. Yeah. In fact, they like, you know, I, I used to get fired around this, these joints around here, you know, for playing instrumentals, you know, all the time. Yeah, I know what they're Now they want me to go back and do more. So I'm going to finish the album at the end of the month and then go and mix it in London. Well, some members of the group wanted to disband. Um, in, in all respect to Richie, Richie was a very strong member. And uh, the first meeting of Tommy we had was, uh, was uh, my meeting with Tommy was he was such a flamboyant character and a lovely guy. Um, just by looking at Tommy, you knew there was something behind all this before he even play, played his guitar. So. Uh, I fell in love with him just as a person. He was a really great guy, number one, okay? But when he played guitar, he played with such abandon. Um, I'd never seen anything like it before. So my thoughts about maybe leaving when Richie left were totally gone at that point. Um, we, had, we had auditioned a couple of other people, um, but Tommy was just the greatest inspirational guitar player, as I've said before, that we decided to carry on. And the spirits in the band were, were, were regained at that point. I think it was more business than anything. You know, I mean, he wasn't a fan of theirs and you may say that they weren't good musicians but he was surprised to find that they were all really incredible musicians they just hit on a, a good formula and took the money and ran you know but again it was another situation where he wasn't happy a very you know sad stigma that followed Tommy joining these groups was the fact that he was always a replacement for a Joe Walsh or Richie Blackmore in the eyes of a lot of fans and this is what they wanted to hear and it was very hard for him to be on stage and hear somebody yell Joe Walsh you know where's Richie this is what haunted him during the English tour was where's Richie you know booed him off the stage he played terribly he just was so unhappy to be responded to like this the reception was miserable so his attitude was miserable and that was just the end of it after that <laughs>
So in early 1976, Tommy finally put together his band, the Tommy Bolin Band, to do his music. On the surface, it looked like the beginning of a long, great solo career. But in less than a year, he would be allowed to die in a Miami hotel room. Well, that was it, you know, that was what it was all about. You know, all these bands, all of this, all the things he had done had finally come into fruition. He had the band he wanted. He handpicked all the musicians. He was going to play his music, and no one was going to tell him to play Smoke on the Water or Funk 49. He was going to do Tommy's music, and he was elated. You know, he had the support of the record companies, the, music, the management, and everyone around him wanted to be a part of it. And it was exciting for him because he finally had some control. He didn't have anyone telling him what to do, and he was able to be as creative, I think, as he wa possibly wanted. But what being in all these other bands taught him was that you still have to be commercial. You still have to do something that sells. You still have to play what people want to hear. And I think he tried to stay in along those lines and be, you know, somewhat sellable to people. So he he learned from those experiences, and I think he tried to do that in the Tommy Bowen band and be, you know, creative, talented, and also free. But there are the restrictions, you know, there were the restrictions from the record company and the fans, and he knew he had to kind of stay within those guidelines. But it was, it was a happy time at first, and also with having your own band were the responsibilities, and that was hard on him. Fronting a band was suddenly very, very hard. Also singing, that was very hard on him, to suddenly have to carry the whole show, doing all the vocals as well as the guitar work. He was terrified. I think the pressure suddenly started setting in. And I think that was the beginning of the downfall because the pit pressures were phenomenal. Jimmy Haslip, now of the Yellow Jackets, was the bassist in Tommy's band and one of the pallbearers at his funeral. Uh, in, in my case, it was kind of a shrouded, mysterious kind of situation. I knew that there was a lot of these things going on. I knew there was possibly some tension with Barry Fay in the office. There was pro possibly some tension with record executives, I'm not sure. Um, his personal life, I think, had tension. Uh, uh, seemed to me uh, maybe, maybe in his love life he had problems. He didn't speak about a lot of these things freely. You know, this was stuff that he kept in, inside. And you could really sense that in spending a lot of time, as we did on the road, that he was keeping a lot of this stuff that was bothering him inside. And it was, you know, uh, at times he seemed very carefree and, and, and just kind of jovial. But inside was an extremely intense burning furnace, you know which at times would maybe come out in, in uh, little blurbs of things that he would say in a conversation, but it wasn't really evident that, that he was going through a lot. Uh, he would hide it. He would hide it. And, and uh, I would try to talk to him about Thing. Sometimes we would talk about some very, you know, deep-rooted uh, uh, issues of, about music, say, and maybe some things would come out, and i try to get them to talk about some stuff, because, you know, I, I even knew then that you, it's not good to hold things in. You have to let it out, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to eat away at you, and you're going to end up getting sick. Um, do you but, think that's uh, what was going on? And that, I think that was, was what was going on. And I think that's, the depend, any dependency he had on drugs probably stemmed from that. Uh, you know, where I know that uh, he might have used drugs as, far, as a form of escape. He always had this theme.